And joining us right now on the Rothman Orthopedics guest line from NBC Sports Philadelphia, one of the most trusted men to ever cover the Eagles, Mr. Ruben Frank joins us. What's going on there, Rube? Interesting introduction. It's probably not true, but I appreciate it. <laughs> it is It is absolutely true. And uh, make sure you guys are following Rube on Twitter, all social media platforms as well. And, of course, uh, and threads, reading threads now. It's not Twitter. It's X. X. That's right. Thank you. Follow, X. Follow me on X. And, uh, and threads. Yes, of course. And all things NBC Sports Philadelphia, especially this article, which came out yesterday. And it just happens to be about what we were talking about yesterday on this very program, the running back room of the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, how does it work? I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about which way you're leaning going into this training camp, Rube. How is this running back room going to shake out? Is it going to be De De DeAndre Swift being the guy to, to take over as the number one guy? Kenny Gainwell? How do you see all these names getting organized by the Philadelphia Eagles? Yeah, I don't think anyone anyone really knows, including Nick, and I think that makes him more dangerous uh, because that means the team they're playing doesn't know. They don't know if they'll get Rashad Penny for 15 carries and Gainwell for seven, Boston Scott for six. They don't know if they're going to get DeAndre Swift for 25, and I think it's going to vary week to week depending on who's going well, the opponent, the situation, the score. Uh, I think Swift has that receiving ability that really no Eagles running back has had in probably since Shady. Um, DeMarco Murray was actually a really good receiver, uh, but he had like 50 catches when he was here. But uh, I, I think that's going to be a dimension we haven't really seen around here in a while. So there's going to be a lot of options. And I think I think one thing about the Super Bowl team in 17, once they got J.H.I. in that trade and they had Corey Clement, Wendell Smallwood, uh, LeGarrette, and J.H.I., nobody knew who was going to be the main guy. And most games it was LeGarrette, but then there was one game where he had no carries and all the other guys had, you know, had a bunch. So I think the more unpredictable you are, the more dangerous you are, the more effective you are. And if they don't know what's going to happen, then the other team doesn't. And and I like that. I, I think a committee is good if all the guys have different strengths. And I, I think that's the case with these guys. Um, but like Nick said, if – if somebody gets the hot hand, he's going to stick with them. And we saw that with Gainwell in the, in the postseason last year. Uh, so it, it's going to be fun. They're all talented. Uh, I don't know if all four can be active on the same day. So you might not see Boston Scott active, which will be maybe just for the Giants games. Uh, but uh, it's uh, it's an interesting group. If they're all healthy, it's a really dangerous group. Mm -hmm. um, is there a chance that we see a little bit more of that screen game with the running backs then with these guys that can catch the ball out of the backfield? Is that actually a chance? Because I feel like that gets talked up a lot in training camp and then we don't see it much during the season. Yeah, I hope so. I think it could be a real weapon for this offense. You saw it a little bit, Miles Sanders, rookie year. Uh, with this offensive line, they're so athletic and they move well and they're, they're, they're so effective out in space. You would think the screen game is something that – uh, they could use, but they really haven't done it. And when they've tried it, it hasn't gone real well. Uh, but I think Swift, and I think Gainwell is a really good receiver too. When you look at his receiving numbers, he's got like 60 catches in two years and very limited playing time. So uh, I think that's going to be uh, a weapon that they really haven't uh, haven't gotten a lot of mileage out uh, out of in a, in a while. Uh, I love screens. It's such a it's such a high percentage play because. You know, nothing bad can happen, and your odds of picking up seven, eight yards are really good. So with these weapons, and you know, I think part of the thing is Jalen is so aggressive. He's so naturally aggressive that I think when I don't think he likes throwing short stuff. He just he's looking down the field, and look, it's one of the things that makes him so dangerous. But one thing the screen game can do is replace some of his carries. Like, how would you rather get eight yards, Jalen going out there and risking himself? running for eight yards or just dumping it off, getting out of the way and watch DeAndre Swift go for eight yards. So I think it could not only be a good weapon, but keep, keep Jalen out of harm's way too. I'm with you hundred percent on that idea, whatever can protect Jalen. And, and speaking of Jalen hurts pro football focus, just left him off their top 50 list. A couple other quarter ways I've read about. <laughs> it's one of those. Yes. That's really good. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm getting better at this, believe it or not. Um, when it comes to uh, that top 50 list, a couple of the quarterbacks were on there. Justin Herbert was on there. Uh, Josh Allen was on there. Of course, Patrick Mahomes, Joe Burrow. What is it going to take? I, I, look, he's an all-pro quarterback. He was runner-up in the MVP. Is it just a matter of him doing it for a longer period of time to really get that national respect that I feel he already deserves? Or do you feel like people are looking at him appropriately? 
I don't think he's really that good when you when you look at it. No, he, he well he wasn't an all pro. He was not an all pro. I was an all pro voter, uh, but yeah, I mean, look, I, I I never get wrapped up in that stuff, ratings and rankings and all that. And I mean, they're fun to do. They're fun to look at. People get all indignant, but I mean, he's proven how. I mean, the guy was what fourteen and one last year, and and took a team to the Super Bowl. And had one of the one of the greatest Super Bowls anybody's ever had. So, um, in my mind, he's the second best quarterback in football, uh, behind Mahomes. Um, he's by far the best in the NFC because you know the guys you mentioned, you know Josh Allen and Burrow, and I mean these are Mahomes. Are, these are all AFC quarterbacks. Uh, I don't even know who the second best QB in the NFC is. Maybe Dak. Maybe Kirk Cousins. I don't know, Daniel Jones. I have no Quite idea. Quite the drop off. Quite the drop off. There is no second. So, you know, those things are people get all all mad and no respect. I, really, it comes down to what you do on the field. And there's no question in my mind, Jalen's going to lead this team as far as they can go this year. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to a couple other unknown things going into this season, you look at the, I think, coordinator positions here. Uh, we don't know much about Sean Desai. We know a little bit about Brian Johnson because he's been here. But let's start with Desai. Is there anything that has jumped out to you just through OTAs, very limited, that you're looking forward to seeing or exploring more as training camp starts up? Yeah, I'd like to meet him. <laughs> 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 Hi, Sean. Yeah, we talked to him once. You know, he didn't say much. Um, I don't. I, I think we will. You know, what I think we'll really learn something about Sean Desai is in the joint practices uh, uh, against the um, the Browns. I think they have one day with the Colts, but that's when like coaches don't want to show what they really do in preseason games because they're televised and everyone sees them. Other teams see them, but joint practices are not. No other teams don't see what you're doing there. So that's when you look, you're going against another team. You can really get us. So I think that's when we'll really get a feel for what he wants to do. Cause I think they will be pretty vanilla starting out in training camp. Just want to see, see guys and see what they could do. Um, really. We have no idea. We have no idea what he wants to run, what he's going to run, how he's going to, I mean, he says he loves rotating his defensive lineman. So that's like, so does everybody else. Right. So, I don't know. Uh, he's mm-hmm. not, how much he's going to mix things up as far as coverages. Uh, we know he doesn't like to blitz, and that's really not a Jonathan Gannon thing or a or a Sean Desai thing. It's really a Nick Sirianni thing. It's that's his vision of the defense: is generate pressure with the linemen, uh, and and don't waste somebody, uh, you know, a defender uh, trying to generate more pressure. So they did that last year. And I think they're going to try to do that again this year. But other than that, and those are really basic things. We have no clue. And and I think that's one of the – and they want it that way. I mean, you know, competitive advantage. Nick's always talking about that. Sure. Um, we'll know. We'll, we'll have a sense in the first couple of weeks of exactly what kind of stuff he likes to run and, and what he's trying to do. Uh, why should Eagles fans have confidence in Brian Johnson as a play caller? Because it's something that is – he hasn't really done – it's his first year as the offensive coordinator, obviously. He's been an offensive coordinator before at different you know, levels of football. But why should Eagles fans and Nick Sirianni even be confident in Brian Johnson as their play caller on game day? It's a great question. And I think he's a very smart guy. Um, he has a really, really good sense of Jalen and what he likes, what he doesn't like. And really, that's that's what a play caller – I mean, that's that's the biggest – thing a play caller has to do is understand his personnel and how to best deploy like what's going to work for Jalen he's known Jalen since he was like four years old so I think he has a really good sense of what Jalen does well and what he likes to run Uh, but also you know he's been around uh, Shane Steichen who I I think well he took over play calling in the middle of 2021 but I think Shane is as good a play caller as we've ever seen around here he had such a flair for it and Doug was was really really good too for a while um, but I think he's been around good people. Like you said, he's, he's called plays before. So you know, on a college level, uh, so he's got a sense of how to do it, but yeah, it's an unknown. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything kind of points to him. He should be good at it, but it's a really tricky thing. Like Nick wasn't good at it. And Nick's a, Nick's a really, really good offensive coach, but he just didn't have a great feel for calling plays those first and whatever it was six or seven games of, of his first year. So Shane was brilliant at it. And, you just hope that I mean, you hope that this for for Nick Sirianni to give an untested coordinator 
uh, play calling duties tells you how much faith he has in him. But it's uh, it's co- you know, college and the NFL are two different animals. So it'll be interesting to watch. I, I really, in all honesty, I had this thought just crossed my mind, and it's going to be a, a dig on Nick, but I don't mean it that way. It's just that you know, I, I think it's good when people know their limitations. And maybe Nick Sirianni just really knows his limitations and says the play calling aspect is not for me game planning through the week love it can do it but when it comes to the end the moment i want somebody else handling that and i'll handle the you know go for it on fourth and short or whatever i'll handle those situations um is there any name that's under the radar and one of the names i keep on seeing is this um ben van sumerin so he just followed me on twitter i was i was like i i I texted zangara and i said this is like the best day of my career What about threads? Did he reach out on threads? No, no. I'm just kind of getting started on there. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I have like 12 followers on threads, but <laughs> um, I, I see this, p- people see this. They'll probably be down to eight. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I read a lot of good things about him, and I'm just yeah. waiting to, to, I don't know. So, I don't have a lot of confidence, but we go ahead. What's your, what's your early, very early take on uh, the undrafted uh, linebacker? He didn't go to the combine. Uh, he had an incredible pro day. His numbers were off the charts. Like they, they would have beaten every linebacker at the combine. Uh, incredible athlete. He just doesn't have any experience. He started out in college as a running back and he transferred from Michigan state to Michigan, no, from Michigan to Michigan state. Yeah. Um, and which is apparently like really frowned on that. They're not real happy with, with guys who do that. It's like, you know, transferring from the Cowboys to the Eagles or something. Right. Um, but, um, he's, he's a physical. And I'll tell you what, at that position, they have so many question marks at that position. So he has a chance to make the team if he can, if he can do something on special teams and really just really learn how to be an NFL linebacker. He's got a lot to learn. I mean, he's a really raw, long-term type of project. Uh, but how he's really good at those. You know, there's a lot of those guys on this team, and they don't mind investing a couple of years on a on, on a guy if he pans out. You know, like a Mulata or like a Brent Toth who's like in his fifth year here and is finally going to be like a backup, one of the top backups. Mm-hmm. So uh, Ben Van Sumer is an interesting guy, great athlete. I think it'll be fun to watch in the preseason. He'll probably like blow up a play and then like just look awful on the next play. You're going to expect that because he just yeah, he just hasn't played much. He's like a one-year starter, converted position. So uh, interesting guy. Well, I'll tell you what, at that position, there are – there are roster spots to be won because they're so thin a linebacker. Okay. Yeah. And you know what? The track record with the Eagles, I mean, Alex Singleton, TJ Edwards, all these guys undrafted, you know, free agents that all of a sudden was their starting middle linebacker. And then you got Ben Van Sumeren coming in here looking to win him spot, win himself a spot maybe down the line. So we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. And he's uh, he's not where those guys were as far as you know, I mean experience was men and like you could tell he was a player, really, mm-hmm. you know, but he, this kid isn't where they were when they got here, but yeah, you know, we'll see. He's going to be a fun one to watch. I want to run a couple uh training camp battles uh, in front of you here. Just tell me which way you're leaning uh, at the start, who you're expecting to come out on top to win those positions. The first one, I did not expect to be a battle, but apparently it's going to be some kind of battle here. Cam Jurgens, Tyler Steen, when it comes to the right guard position on the Eagles offensive line, which way are you leaning? Yeah, I, I think I knew I knew that was going to be the first one. That's like, yeah, right. <laughs> like, this team is so good that we like we worry about right guard. You know, like no other <laughs> team in the world worries about right guard. But I'll tell you what, Isaac Samuel was a top ten guard last year, and they're going to miss him. He's with the Steelers now, and we're it's funny because we're all kind of just assuming. Well, Jeff Stoutland's his coach. How he drafted him, so he's going to be great. <laughs> but it's not that easy. He only played 35 snaps last year on offense, and he's small for a center for a, for a guard. He's 290, which is Kelsey esque for a center, but it's small for a guard. Uh, so it's not a slam dunk that he's going to come in and be a, a Pro Bowler uh, from the get go. Um, I think he'll get uh, he'll get the first team reps when uh, when Kelsey's practicing, and then when Kelsey he'll probably take every other practice off. He's 35. He's a hall of famer. Like how many practices does he need? So then Jurgens will play center and Tyler Steen will play right guard when Kelsey takes off. And then, you know, they'll both get that experience. But I think one thing that really helps Cam Jurgens, and, and I, I mean, I do think he's going to win the job. I think he'll hang on to the job. I don't really, I don't believe it's an open competition because I think he's so far ahead of a rookie. He's, he gets to play between lane and Kelsey. So, 
possibly two Hall of Famers, potentially. We'll see about Lane. Um, that's That can only help. But just being around those guys all last year, being around Isaac, uh, Landon Dickerson, and, and just learning from Kelsey, how can you not be ready? So I think he's going to be pretty good. But uh, Isaac Samoa was a really good guard, so it's, it's not a slam dunk that this kid will be able to come in and play at that level from the jump. So, so leaning, leaning Cam Jurgens in the early goings. Yeah, I'm more than leaning. I mean, he he's he, got the job. Okay, he's got ninety five percent. He's got the job. <laughs> Unless he really, I mean, maybe he blows up and Tyler Steen, you know, who's more of a he looks more like a guard. He's like what three twenty, three twenty five. Um, so, uh, you know, certainly if Cam has a tough camp or gets banged up. You know, you'd like to see the kid come in, but I think it'll be Jerkins. All right. Uh, next one up for you is the safety position. I think Reed Blankenship, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Reed Blankenship is pretty much a lock. I think you look at the other safety position, and you're talking about uh, Terrell Edmonds is a guy that could come in there and uh, have some uh, have some success possibly. Or uh, you could have a guy like uh, Sidney Brown come in and be your starting safety next to Blankenship. Which way are you leaning that way? I'm actually leaning Sidney Brown. Maybe not right from the get-go. Um and, and you know, Terrell Edmonds, I mean, he's he's 26 and he started 75 games in the NFL. So, like, he's not a slouch. He's not a great player, but he's a functional safety. Um, but they they drafted Sidney Brown to play. And I think they're going to give him every opportunity to win that job. Um, I think it's going to be tough for him to come in as a rookie and beat out an established veteran. But they're both new in this defense as well. So it might not be week one, but. I'd be surprised if Sidney Brown's not the starter at some point, you know, week six, week eight, somewhere like that. But if he has a good camp, I mean, they didn't pay, they didn't pay Edmonds anything. I think 600 grand. I mean, that's Mark Farzetta money. Um, so they could you know, <laughs> cut him uh, or bench him or replace him or have him play special teams. They're, they're not committed to him in any way. Uh, but Sidney Brown's here for four years. They're committed to him. They want him to win the job. That's the thing with these guys with one-year contracts, you know, whether it's like Anthony Harris, there's no commitment there. If if, if he's the best guy, he's going to play. But if a young guy is better, that young guy is going to play. And I think that could be the case here. But Edmonds is a good player. I think it's going to be Blankenship and and Sidney Brown at some point early in the season. All right, yeah, and six hundred k. By the way, that's just what we. That's one. That's a one minute read on this show. That's what we charge. <laughs> Them's the breaks. <laughs> um, <laughs> which is why you're getting paid with a mixtape of uh, you know the mixed cassette tape of preferred music. Anyway, uh, last one for you, Watkins <laughs> Zaki. <laughs> Watkins Zacchaeus Zacchaeus which way do you go Olamade Zacchaeus how do you say it? Uh, which way are you going there for third receiver good question uh, that's going to be an interesting battle I, I think they really want Quez to win that because he's got I mean we saw two years ago what he's capable of doing um, but last year was just such a disaster um, I think Zacchaeus probably probably has the best shot to be the third guy, but they really want Quez to win that job. Um, I also think they might trade Quez. He might be a guy who just needs change of scenery. They don't have a lot of depth at that position behind. Uh, they got two great starters, but and and I think Zacchaeus is a pretty good guy. But and he's actually he can run. It's not like he's like the slow possession guy and Quez is the fast guy. But Quez's speed is really rare, and his ability to track a ball is exceptional. He just doesn't always hold on to it when he tracks it. So um, the potential is there for him to, to bounce back. He's got the ability. Um, you know, we'll see how strong mentally he is because, I mean, last year was a nightmare. It was a nightmare before the Super Bowl. But to drop a touchdown pass in a Super Bowl that might have brought a championship to your city, that's a tough thing to overcome. And I'm not sure he can do that. And that's why I think, you know, the other uh, the last time we talked to Nick, he was talking him up saying how great he was in OTAs which is so uncharacteristic. I mean, Nick won't say that about, you know, Jim Brown could be at OTAs and he was like, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll see about the backs. You know, we, we got Wendell Smallwood. We got, you know, Corey Clement. We got Jim Brown. You know, we'll, we'll see how it sorts out. All the same. He won't compliment anybody, but he was so quick to, to, to compliment Quez that it made me think either they're trying to really build up his confidence, which they're concerned about, or they're, they just want to trade him. And I don't know how much you can get for him, but he's got rare speed and teams want speed. They want those traits. So uh, an interesting one, uh, the same day that Nick told us what a great OTA Quez was having, he dropped the ball in the bubble like 20 minutes later. So 
we'll see. I'm going to go with Zacchaeus, though. I just uh, – and I like I like Quez. I like that he was a stand-up guy last year. When he messed up, he stood at his locker and he faced all the cameras and answered every question. I, I appreciate that. Not a lot of guys do that, uh, but I think Zacchaeus is the guy. Gotcha. Uh, because Ruben, how Frank, can you? How can you? I'm not, I'm not, shut up! I'm not done yet. Oh, I'm sorry. I, in a big moment, can you really rely <laughs> on Quez on Quez Watkins at this point? I, I, I just, you know, maybe if he really proves himself over the over the season, but man. Two, I mean, you look at the, the two balls in Dallas that he got out muscled for. You look at the fumble uh, against Washington and the drop against the Chiefs. I mean, the Eagles lost four games last year. And he he was responsible for three of them. I mean, the Saints game's the only game he didn't have a major role in losing that game. Mm-hmm. So as much as I'd like to say Quez on that one, I'm going to go with the other kid. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then we'll officially learn how to pronounce his name. <laughs> uh, Ruben, now before you go, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to I'm going to get I'm going to get back to you on this, and of course we'll air okay. this interview uh, for Tuesday morning show. But I am going to ask my audience to just give me their favorite music venue in the Philadelphia area, and you know maybe maybe there's one you haven't heard of, maybe there's one you haven't been to yet, and maybe you know you can check that out later because I know what a music guy you are. My favorite venue is probably Johnny Brenda's, but Ooh, very nice so freaking hard to park there because everything's to a two hour meter unless you have a permit and you could drive around for hours trying to park and there's like some $20 lots if you can get a spot them you got to get there early uh, going to Johnny Brenner's on a weekend plus the show started like 11 like the, the headliner comes out at 11 too old for that um, but I, I do I do love Johnny Brenda's um, I like this 118 North have you ever been down there it's a new no. venue it's in Wayne. It's right across the street. Wayne's a cool little town, by the way. And 118 North, I actually played there with my friend's band, Illinois. And uh, it's right across from the Wayne train station. It's really cool. They have great food, awesome sound. Um, so those are a couple of them. World Cafe is the old standby, really solid venue. Mm-hmm. Easy to park. That's big. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to I'm gonna ask my audience. And Union Transfer, as far as the bigger places, Union Transfer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, oh, I do miss living right down the street from there. Yeah. Um, Ruben Frank, I'll ask the audience to see if they have any suggestions. If one jumps out to me, I'll be sure to forward it to you, my friend. I Thank appreciate you, you stopping by. Hey, enjoy the hell out of training camp. Enjoy the hell out of preseason. I'm sure I'll be talking to you down the line, though, and uh, hope all else is well, my friend. Thank you so much. Anytime, Mark. Thank you. Ruben Frank joins us, NBC Sports Philadelphia. Make sure you read all his stuff, all his latest stuff on NBCSportsPhiladelphia.com and the NBC Sports app as well, including this article, Nick Sirianni hints at how he'll use his Eagles fleet of running backs. And I'm sure you can read all the stuff that Ruben will be writing all through training camp and the season. Thanks again, Ruben. You got it, Mark. See you, bud.